Hi, I'm the Board Game Bandit, and this is Gamer Academy, where we teach you how to talk like a gamer. Today, I have Dara Russ and Eric Lassie with me, and we're here to talk about cooperative games. Thank you both for being here. Thank you, Jim. Oh, thank you. So cooperative games are an interesting genre because people have varying forms of relationships with them. I'm really excited to hear what both of you have to say. Before we start, I think it's important to make sure that we are all on the same page as to what we consider to be a cooperative game. Like most mechanics, this can be particularly difficult to define. So what do you think is a cooperative game? Well, a cooperative game would be where everybody has the same end goal and they win or lose together. So the way I defined it was very similar. Cooperative play is where individuals are involved in mutual assistance and working towards a common goal. I know that's a broad definition and it's not very much of a mechanic as it is a genre that covers a broad spectrum. Before I go even further, I'm going to let you define yours. A cooperative game is one in which several players share an objective and everyone knows what their objective is, regardless of whether or not they're all on the same team. So Jim, uh, before we go, I'm going to call it audible. I want us to take a moment and answer a two-part question in order for ourselves and our listeners an opportunity to understand our bias on cooperative games. I'm pretty sure we're going to have a broad spectrum on that. Uh, first, how do you feel about cooperative board games? And secondly, and more importantly, why do you feel that way? To answer the question that you didn't ask, um, this is my show and we <laughs> go by the script, but whatever, we'll do it your way. So what were the questions? The first one is, how do you feel about co uh, cooperative board games and why? So I was going to ask that anyway of everybody else, but we'll do it your way. I have a love-hate relationship with cooperative board games. If you asked me this at varying points during today alone, I probably would have given you three different answers. So the answer I'm going to give right now is that I have a love-hate relationship. There are things that I really like about them. There are things that I really don't like. I think right now there's a little bit of too many cooperative games. And why do I feel that way? I think that cooperative games can do things really well. I think they can create some great shared experience among players. I also think that they can be very difficult for new players, particularly if you're playing with an experienced player uh, because of the quarterbacking effect, which I'm sure is going to come up. I also think that it decreases your individuality. And if you were trying intentionally to involve other people, you're not being as engaged as you normally would be. And that's been a problem for me in the past. There, well, I hate cooperative board games, but I'm sure that by the end of this podcast, you will convince me otherwise. You don't hate. You <laughs> said that cooperative <laughs> games are your favorite mechanic. I know. I love I love cooperative board games. Um, I am a reforming, because I'm not completely reformed quarterback. I'm working on it. Um, got some self-awareness there. A lot to go still. Don't give me that look, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> she knows. We run out of time constraint. We'll get into that. For myself, I fall... Uh, in the middle. Uh, I don't say it's a love-hate. Um, I don't hate them, and I don't love them. So it's not a love-hate. It's uh, indifference. Typically judge a game on the whole, and the cooperative mechanic is just one aspect of the game. So when I play a game, I'm focused more on the people around me and if they are enjoying themselves or getting frustrated. That being said, I see uh, a couple of major flaws in the game, one being quarterbacking, which you mentioned, and uh, programmable enemies. So let's talk about what each of those are in order to make sure that everyone is on the same page. And for those listening, they may not know the terms. So quarterbacking means one player assumes command and tells everybody what to do. It is an unfair slur. <laughs> it's also known as the alpha player, in case you've heard that term. So why would you say that's unfair, Dara? Please expand. I'm just kidding. It's pretty fair. But, it, I mean, quarterbacking happens. It's not always intentional. For example, um, Pandemic's what got me into gaming, and it's one of my favorite games, and I quarterbacked in that game hardcore for a really long time, and then I've taken a step back from that, but at the same time, I've seen with teaching it to new people that as soon as someone understands that game, if you teach it to someone, the very next time you're playing with that person and there are new people, like, how do you stop that new person from quarterbacking the other people without discouraging them because they're also new to gaming? Like, it's a difficult line. Like, people who are quarterbacking usually don't have ill intentions and usually they don't know that it's a problem um, I think it's also a personality um, issue with me quarterbacking is not a problem I can full-on quarterback if I'm playing with other players who are just as assertive right and that's I think that's the dynamic you have to have 
a fair balance of people in order to be a fun and engaging game. Uh, if it's one person that's just dominating, then they're basically playing the board game Solitary Edition. I agree with a lot of what Dara has said, particularly because cooperative games tend to have higher player counts. If you're playing a cooperative game, you typically want to do that with more than one person. And sometimes, let's say you're playing a game with four, which Pandemic supports, or five, which games like Forbidden Desert support. If one person is really having a hard time, you sometimes need to tell them what to do in order to make sure that everybody else has a good experience. Do you sacrifice the group in favor of the one person? It's a very difficult balance to maintain. Absolutely. That um, reminds me of an experience I had recently, but first I want to ask a clarifying question about your definition of cooperative games, Jim, because from your definition, I believe that one versus all games would fit. Yes, I'm counting one versus all. Okay, then I can talk about Fury of Dracula, your favorite game. Yeah, so actually, uh, I wanted to expand upon that. What do we classify as cooperative games? Because in my definition, I had three different uh, subsections to it. Let's talk about uh, programmable enemies first. Okay. So the Are we way done with quarterbacking? <laughs> we could do an entire segment on quarterbacking, but we don't have enough time for that. Don't worry, I'll touch back on that later on. Uh, so programmable enemies flaw is where the enemies cannot adapt to the players. It's not cunning. It will behave strictly according to the rules. For example, my mystics. The opponents will not attack the same player repeatedly if given another option. A real player, a, as in a uh, case of a mastermind like Fury of Dracula, would swarm on a player to eliminate them. Or they could use that to their advantage. If you could quickly swarm an enemy and eliminate one player, that would make it easier for the mastermind to continue to win. Versus the programmable will have to fight everybody evenly and distribute the damage, and while that might be fun, it's not realistic. I think there are certain games that will mitigate that, and I'm sure we'll talk about that. Mechs and Minions is the one that jumps out to mind, where you know if you are in attack range or not, and there may be some movement there, but it's ultimately up to you to avoid either being attacked or to specifically move into attack range because you feel that you can do more damage being in that vicinity than staying behind and trying to attack from afar. Actually, the exact game came to mind for me, but for the reason that there's no elimination in that game. So even if you coincidentally do get attacked a lot, the worst that can happen is your pro your command line is ruined, um, but you're not eliminated versus if Mice and Mystics had a more realistic enemy where they continually attacked one person, then somebody's going to have a less enjoyable experience than everyone else. And even in Mice and Mystics, you don't have complete elimination you're just out for that um round pretty much but in other games where players are eliminated that's gonna i mean how many games are there co-op games that have a player elimination is that a thing that's actually on my list of weaknesses of co-op games as to how they handle player elimination we're going to get back to that in a second i know we're covering a lot of topics all at once but we're going to try and zero in on some of them so the next thing we we're going to talk about which Eric mentioned was, what are some examples of cooperative games? What we do with Gamer Academy when we're defining a mechanic is we talk about what we consider to be our quintessential cooperative game, the first one that comes to mind. So Dara, what would be yours? Well, that's hard. You know, that pandemic is like where I'm leaning towards, but it's not what I would actually recommend like as a starter for people now at this moment in time. So uh, that's, a sep that's a separate question. So what is the first one that comes to your mind? It's Pandemic. It was the first cooperative game I played. So my first cooperative game will actually be Harry Potter, Hogwarts Battle. What? Quintessential cooperative game. That's oh, the first that's one the that comes to your mind. No, it's the first one that comes to your mind. Okay. First one that comes to my mind as well-balanced and cooperative. It's the first one I would recommend. <laughs> <laughs> my first one would also be Pandemic. It's not the first cooperative game I played. That actually falls to Castle Panic, which is a bit of an oddity because there's three different forms of cooperative play. And I just think Pandemic is the one that's the most known. It's the it's easily a pure co-op game. You just play it all together. And I think it certainly has the brand name recognition. Eric, you mentioned that you felt that there were several subsections of cooperative play. So why don't you tell us about them? So the subsections that I have is one where it's completely cooperative like Pandemic and Harry Potter. Now you have others that are mastermind, where it's one versus all, like Fury of Dracula. And then last but not least, team versus team base. 
such as Battlestar Galactica, code names, Last Night on Earth, and I even venture to say, bang, the dice game is cooperative. Granted, it has an aspect of social dedu- deduction thrown in there. I'm going to argue with you there because I think Bang the Dice Game is a social deduction game that has elements of cooperative play the other way around. It's a social deduction game first. I do like your breakdowns. Um, I am, And I know that I am contradicting myself because just a week ago I told you team games are not cooperative. I am now – I've – switch sides on this a little bit um, did some research on what the definition of a cooperative was no actually that's from a from a bgg standpoint uh partnerships are a separate mechanic that determines whether or not there are teams i think it, uh, it ultimately comes down to my definition that the objectives are known if there are two teams and you know who's on what team i consider that to be cooperative if they're working together and in addition to partnerships um, and that's also why I'm counting one versus all as opposed to something like the trader mechanic. I think the trader mechanic is an aspect of social deduction because people aren't really working together. I think more often than not, they are doing whatever they want to do while trying to sniff out who the trader is. Once the trader gets burned, then it becomes more of a one versus all if there's only one trader sort of thing. And that's totally true in Battlestar Galactica. Unless you have two Cylons, then it's a little more dynamic. Or a Cylon leader. Oh, I haven't, you know, I've never played with the expansion for Battlestar Galactica. You're missing out. But the Cylon leader is known to be bad. You just don't know what they're trying to do. They could be good, though. They could want the humans to win. They just want them to hurt a little first. I don't, I don't know enough about the Cylon leader. I know that their, obje- their personal objective is hidden. Yes, it's either that they want the humans to win or the humans to lose, but in each um, case, there's victory conditions. So even if they want the humans to win, they might want them to win, but only have X amount of resources. The final, I would add one more subgenre to what you were saying, and that would be semi-cooperative. And semi-cooperative is a whole other topic that I honestly don't feel works. There's only one example of a semi-cooperative game that I really enjoy, and that's Between Two Cities. In semi-cooperative, there's still one player who wins, but inherently the game is forcing people to work together in order to facilitate someone winning. And Castle Panic was my first semi-cooperative game, and I bought it because it was something I had never heard of, it didn't seem like there really were many semi-cooperative games. And there's a reason for that, because it doesn't really work as a mechanic. I'm going to argue on that point. I don't think that Between Two Cities is a cooperative game. It's it, a I partnership. Said, or it's a semi-cooperative. It's a partnership at best, but you still want the other guy to lose. You're not sharing a completely same objective. That's why it's called semi-cooperative. The point is, is that you are forced to work with another person, and it's actually... Cooperative play is separate from partnerships in terms of mechanic specification. They very often work in conjunction with each other, but in, se- in if you don't work with the other player, you will lose because you will both get no points if you build a terrible city. I would like to get in on this arguing action. I, for one, do not count one versus all as cooperative. I think that is a completely separate category. There are enough games now for that to be a genre on its own. If, if you want to make that a separate mechanic, I'm fine with that. I actually really like one versus all games on both sides of the equation. But for right now, it seems like that's... From what I looked at that specifically on BoardGameGeek, it seems like they call they categorize that as partnerships instead of cooperative play. I think that's... I don't always agree with their assessments. But I'm counting it as cooperative, but I do not... I can understand why you don't think that they are. I think that they would very likely appeal to the same group of people who like cooperative games because there are a lot of elements that are the same. I I, I would uh, concede that if you, it is growing large enough that eventually it could grow into its own genre and it's probably right at the cusp right now. Um, we probably just need more games. Although now that I'm thinking about it a little bit more, that would cross out D and D, and D and D is definitely something I would consider cooperative. But that is also one versus all because you have the dungeon master. So uh, let me just eat my own words. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll let you eat them. How they taste? <laughs> this is why you don't argue with us people. <laughs> so we've gone over what we consider to be cooperative games. We've started with some of the problems, but there are some things that cooperative games do well. Now, Dara, as you mentioned, this is your favorite mechanic, so you'd probably be best suited to talk about the strengths. I also have some things that I like about that. I'm sure, Eric, you do as well. But, Dara, 
What are your favorite things about cooperative games? Um, the strengths for cooperative games, first and foremost, I think is teaching them. Unlike when you're teaching competitive games, even if you forget a rule, if you remember it partway through, it's never like, oh, wow, you remember that rule at a time that's just advantageous for you only. You know, it's, oh, I didn't hear that. You didn't tell me that. You, you don't get that as much. Um, and it's just easier to help new gamers get into the hobby if you're working on the same page. And so as long as you try to avoid the quarterbacking, um, I think it's a lot better to get people engaged on a common goal. To help people prevent themselves from quarterbacking, what would you suggest to them? I have a lot of things for that. I don't know if you want to get into that yet. I don't want to get into that yet because I also want to go into that. I All right. got details. <laughs> Very much. Yeah. Because I have to think of a lot um, of different things that you could do. But going off that, if you are inclined to quarterback, cooperative games also play very well solo usually. <laughs> if there's some there where you don't have to have cards hidden, like uh, Mice and Mystics, where everything's on the table. You see everything. You could play solo Mice and Mystics Solitary Edition if you wanted to. I think. Yes. That's also going to come up in my weaknesses, but let's uh, let's That's go with the strength. strengths first. That's a strength, Jim. Some of us don't like people. <laughs> <laughs> so let's just mark that down in our book categories. I'd like to I'd like to state for the record that I've said you know you can play Pandemic by yourself, which Dara has said is the best way to play Pandemic. I was so excited when I saw that one of the expansions had a solo mode. Like, it was one of the, like, happiest and saddest moments at <laughs> once because I was in the game store with a friend, and I'm like, oh, my God. And then I realized how sad it was. I was so excited. <laughs> and then I found out about the app, and then I didn't even need the solo mode because I can just play all four characters. It's great. Nice setup time. So, Eric, strengths. <laughs> uh, the strength is, uh, personality-wise, some people aren't very competitive, and they hate the conflict generated by co uh, competitive games and this allows you to be bring in more people to board games that otherwise would just test it I, yeah i fully agree with that in fact that's what originally brought me into gaming it's just i played pandemic we lost on like i don't even know if i got a second turn but the idea like oh my god here's a cooperative game theoretically i can play this without arguing with people you know whereas before i think i had tried maybe to play risk and i'm like i can't do this we're fighting to no not Oh, I think Monopoly, um, what's the electronic one, is the last game that I tried to play with a significant other before I got into gaming, and that did not go well. It was a lot of arguing, so I was like, this is awesome. We're going to be on the same team. My brother and I used to write up contracts during Monopoly, and we would sign them and everything, and then, yeah, there was... So and to this day, you do not speak to one another. No, <laughs> uh, to this day, our wives will not play with us while we play <laughs> Monopoly, because they saw us writing contracts, like, wait, what are you doing? Like, I'm writing a contract. And I'm signing it. I think the better question is, why are you still playing Monopoly after everything I've taught you? This was actually before I met you. Okay. I make your life better. <laughs> Indeed. We don't have contracts. Wait till we start doing contracts and uh, Splendor. <laughs> Nightfall, I agree to attack you. Or I, I agree not to attack you. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have to start having uh, written contracts and signing in blood. <laughs> Very thematic for that game. But anyway, so strengths of cooperative play. I said this before, but... I think when you win a cooperative game with people, it can feel like you accomplish something truly special. And some of my favorite memories are when I've won a game that was really difficult and you know that you're dead on the next turn and you just made it. And that's great. Um, a specific example comes to mind. We beat Forbidden Desert with five players on normal difficulty. And I went into work and I told someone and a coworker overheard that that we won with five players. And he's like, you lie. You're a dirty liar. <laughs> and it's like, no, we really did. And it, it was awesome. And, you know, that's a special memory that gets created. Uh, another strength would be that cooperative games have scaled levels of difficulty, which I think also makes it easier to bring in people because you can say, all right, if if you're feeling not confident in the group's abilities, you can suggest that they do it on easy or they can do it on medium. Or if they are really feeling ambitious, they can go on the harder or the expert or the legendary mode, depending on what game it is. And I really like that about it, that you can play the game at a level that you feel comfortable. That's why I would say one of the strengths of Harry Potter, is the Hogwarts battle, is that it slowly ramps up the difficulty. And you can have 
you had that first introduction, first three games, first three years, and what they call it, where it's campaign style, but it slowly eases you into the mechanic, and it slowly introduces more and more mechanics. And if you maintain the same player group, they will all learn together. Now, the weakness of that is if you don't have a consistent play group, you're going to always be struggling with trying to get through the whole campaign. You can't just pick up where you left off. You can to a varying degree, and if other players are familiar with the game, then yes, you can actually pick up wherever you want. But if somebody's brand new to cooperative games and even deck builders, you're going to need to want to start from the beginning so they're not lost. Okay, I was going to disagree with you until you clarified brand new because I feel like if somebody's just familiar with deck building, they can pick up in almost any part of the Harry Potter game that I've played so far at least. Um, but I agree that Harry Potter's um, Hogwarts Battle is like a great game to start off if you're new to co-ops. Um, one thing is that the very first game, they if you've done a deck builder before, they suggest you just skip it. And I didn't believe that. But if you've played a deck builder before, skip the first game. It is too easy. Yeah, they actually recommend that you start at year three if you're oh. familiar with deck buildings. Nice. I didn't realize it was all the year three. but Yeah, at year three, it starts introducing a new mechanic. Following on what Eric would sa was saying, I actually think encouraging the same play group is the strength of cooperative games, particularly as you start to see some of the legacy games that you play and the game evolves as you're doing it. I think there's a, it really emphasizes the social aspect that, you know, everyone knows each other, they know the rules, and they're just trying to refine it and perfect their approach over time. And I think that's a strength. It's also a weakness because it can turn into a little bit of a click, which I've noticed, but the truth is that that could happen independent of the game genre if the personalities lend themselves that way. It's just particularly the case in cooperative. Or you can find out that you don't get along with a particular group, which is why I've played uh, Pandemic Legacy Season 1 two and a half times instead of three. Oh. I know, sadness. And you went and picked up the Solitary Edition and kept going? No, I have. <laughs> maybe in a few years I will just play it by myself for fun, but I don't know. My first group did well enough that I, I don't think I had anything to prove there. So when you asked if you could join our Pandemic Legacy group, I'm now on the fence about it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that I realistically have time have you already picked all four people no not yet we we have one open spot so oh we're gonna man. start accepting applications does Let's anyone else have any time. strengths about cooperative games because sure, i have a list of weaknesses oh no let's think of more strengths so we don't <laughs> get to the weaknesses i think whatever you list as weakness i'm gonna say as a strength so just give me your list of weaknesses cooperative games are extremely susceptible to a bad player what do you mean so Hanabi, can you imagine playing Hanabi where you have, what is it, eight clues that you can give? Imagine if someone is giving out useless clues. I have done that. I'm not personally, I mean, I've played that game. I have been in the same game as that player. And how does that make you feel? Like crushing something. Exactly. Now imagine when, um, imagine when you're, and this is, I think you're right that cooperative games are easy to teach. As long as you're teaching but not playing. I've taught Pandemic a lot and I've gotten a lot of success by teaching Pandemic to four new people who have never played before. They really work well together. I'm not very good. I'm actually surprisingly bad at Pandemic. For someone who's as good as Forbidden Island and Forbidden Desert, I play them both on Legendary, do really well. I really struggle with Pandemic on Standard. I don't know why. But I, I still really know... This. I'm like, I won't believe it till I see it. Oh, you will. But... You know, I usually teach it on introductory mode because I want people to win and have a good time. I do the opposite. Not because I don't want them to have a good time, but I like for them to have it be pretty much impossible because then it ends really quickly and they can play again on the easier setting. But I also feel like that kind of combats the quarterback and you don't have time. They're, they're dying. <laughs> so I suggest teaching it on like the most extreme difficulty possible. And letting them die. That's how I enjoy it. That's why I bought the game is because I didn't have enough time for someone to quarterback. We lost. Well, that's your opinion. But anyway. <laughs> just, you enjoy losing together. It gives you, you want to come back to it. It's like a challenge. This Some is, people just want to see the world burn. This is, this is a real problem I have because <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm experienced in a game, regardless of what game it is, and we're supposed to be working cooperatively, if you say something that honestly makes no sense, in the spirit of being cooperative, am I supposed to just accept that? Especially yes. if it's going to make it 
be really difficult for us to win. That is a hard barrier that I have time crossing because it's I, I basically have to accept handicap, you know, from the team and that I just I'm not good at that. It's like, you know, we could do that or we could do this other thing that, you know, would actually pan out. You got to do like a risk reward assessment at that time, which makes me uh, think of what I was going to mention earlier, which was playing Fury of Dracula. Um, the last time I played, it was going to be three of us and we all knew the game really well. Like, this is going to be a breeze. We'll go right through this. And then two people came up who'd never played before and they wanted to play. And we're not jerks. We're like, sure, join us, you know? Sorry. And <laughs> Wait, was that the game I was in? Or that? No, 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 oh, no, 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 no. Game. I thought it was that, that game. I'm like, <laughs> no, 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 no. Sorry. That, uh, no that one that present. game lasted, what, and six hours? I wanna, <laughs> I would, no, and I want to preface that these were very nice people. But at one point in the game, very late, one of them was just like, you know what, this game's not for me. Is it okay if I bow out? And we were like, yes, it is very okay. Like, we would have been okay had you admitted that sooner because on his turns, he was moving to one spot. On his next turn, he moved back to the where he was before. And it was definitely a disadvantage for the um, players who were searching for Dracula because you have to cover ground to find Dracula. If one player is just using their turn to go back and forth between the same two places – like good luck you know but the three of us who were the most invested in the game had all played it before and we're like willing to allow our experience to be a little more meh for the sake of being social and friendly and not putting other people off unless they listen to this podcast i'm sorry (laughs) so how do you introduce uh new people to the genre well we're still not done with my weaknesses yet yeah, well let's get through his strengths. That's one of the weaknesses. <laughs> that's one of the weaknesses I wanted to bring up. It's difficult to bring in new people when you have the majority I of people experience. That's why I you don't teach consider them. Fury of Dracula a cooperative game. So it it, ah. it, it is well because you don't like one because you don't consider it to be one ver- one I versus all to be cooperative. That's true. Right, and but I, I like one versus all, but it's different. So Fury of Dracula should not be your first cooperative game. Simply put. You know, <laughs> your first cooperative game should be under three hours. I still haven't. I have played four hours of Fury of Dracula, and I still have not technically played a full game. You must always clarify that it was second edition and not third edition, which vastly improves. <laughs> They're coming out with a new edition, by the way. So Jim has p- completed. <laughs> if you have to keep inventing new editions of a game, there's something wrong. There. No, they're coming out with a new edition because of like a rights issue. Like the two um, companies split that produced it, and so now they. For it to be a product, they have to come out with a new one. So, Anger of Dracula? Yes. Okay. Or Revenge of Dracula. Because oh. Fury is copyrighted? No. <laughs> they, ha- they I mean, they own the rights to the IP. They don't own the rights to the rule book, is what I heard, which is going to be interesting because I don't know that you can copyright rule books, but we'll see. What so, happens. another weakness, and this is something that Dara hit on, is... As what a strength. <laughs> well, just something that you were, you were mentioning. One of my tests for whether or not I'll enjoy a cooperative game is whether or not the game can be played with multiple instances of yourself. And what I mean by that is like on an app. If you can basically take the form of multiple players, that doesn't seem like a game I'd want to play cooperatively because I could very easily play by myself. And a game like Oniram, which I normally wouldn't play, I actually really enjoy as an app. Apparently you can play Oniram with the second player. I just have no idea what that would look like. I've done that. It's okay. It makes it a little more difficult, if I remember correctly. But does it make it fun? It just depends on who you're playing with. So, Pandemic and Forbidden Desert, I can play those on my iPad by myself, and I really enjoy that. It just becomes like a personal puzzle. If I if I can play it without you, that means that it, I have no reason to listen to you, technically, and that is more of an incentive to quarterback. So, Eric, when you asked earlier... How do you prevent people from quarterbacking? I would say play a game that actually inhibits, pro- that makes quarterbacking near impossible. And I'll get to some examples of that. My final one is that cooperative games have an interesting take on player elimination. Usually when one player dies, in my experience, the entire group loses. And that can kind of mute the personality aspect of a game and de-emphasize the role of the individual. For example... If one person drowns or one person dies of thirst in Forbidden Island or Forbidden Desert, the entire group will lose, so that incentivizes people in order to do work together. I actually think it would be more interesting 
particularly in a one versus all like scenario where if you're going to die and be out of the game but the group can live on other players might be more inclined to sort of ditch you to the wolves and i actually like how that would change the game because it wouldn't make teamwork be an automatic thing it would people would really have to try hard in order to do that like they pick your uh corpse of loot your corpse for items and then maybe eat you (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I was I was gonna say more just they they abandon you and then they say like you know well you're gonna die good luck with that you know we're <laughs> or just gonna somebody can make a noble sacrifice Jeez, dude we don't have to murder everybody <laughs> we could but it's my example's better that's a different game right <laughs> yeah so I would have liked to see a different take on the aspect of player elimination once people get emotionally invested because they know that they'd be out of the game I think that's a different story last night on Earth as a teamwork game really comes to mind where you don't want to be the one who's dead, but the group can still win. But sometimes you want to go out in a blaze of glory with armed with like a shotgun and a chainsaw. And it's like, all right, I'm going to take out as many as I can. (laughs) It definitely, in my opinion, in my opinion, enhances the entertainment value. Absolutely. When you have those moments where everybody's at the end just laughs or at least during a period, everybody laughs. I think it's a noble game. Yeah. So I mentioned that there are some games where you can preclude quarterbacking based on how the game is designed. Do you agree with that idea, and can you think of any examples? I can think of a lot of examples, and in addition to that, I can think of ways where you can mitigate that yourself by changing setup um, things. So not necessarily that a game is particularly designed to prevent quarterbacking, but you can do things such as in Pandemic. Um, One thing I do is I don't play with the dispatcher the dispatcher just lends itself to quarterbacking. So take that role out. You're good. For those who aren't familiar, the dispatcher is the role that lets you move other people on your turn. It's very powerful. But why would you want that in your game if you don't like quarterbacking? Because there's only so many actions you can take on a turn if you need to move someone great distances in order to be able to facilitate a trade. Operations expert. Gotcha. Again, I'm not very good at pandemic, so <laughs> take this at face value. <laughs> I'm just playing devil's advocate. But to answer your question, um, games that can that are designed to uh, prevent or reduce quarterbacking, I think, are games where your hand is hidden, or games where there is a time constraint and you don't have time to like examine what other people do are doing. Such as like in Mex versus Minion, once you start drafting after the first draft, you're drafting with a timer, and it's like I don't have time to worry about what you're selecting right now. I need to fix my command line. Um, And also things like uh, Mysterium in particular, where there's an incentive for people to allow people to be wrong. Like you have intuition tokens. So even if another player is wrong, other players can gain intuition by correctly guessing that that player is wrong. So that kind of reduces the desire for people to tell other players how to choose i have a great example about mysterium now that you bring it up uh, i agree with you that mysterium is very quarterbacking that you can't quarterback much in mysterium but for a different reason because there's no objective right or wrong in that game and i have a great example we we're playing with dara as the ghost actually this is at a 24-hour game night I'm and i'm playing with uh we're playing with six people Myself and my wife are included, and my wife is a very visual person, and I thought she would enjoy Mysterium. And I had never played with Dara as the ghost before. I played much more as the ghost, but Dara and I have actually never played Mysterium together up until this point, oddly enough. And so I don't know what she's like as the ghost, but I know her as a person, so I'm intrigued. And she hands out the card that has the magic carpet. And I look at it, and a number of us look at it, and we're all thinking, you know, Magic Carpet, Arabia, it's going to be the adventurer because there's lots of gold tokens. And my wife looks at it and says, no, it's a Magic Carpet. It's a form of transportation. It's the chauffeur. And I stop and I look at her and I'm saying, wait, that actually makes a lot of sense. And it turns out she's completely correct. A group of us thought one thing, but one person's opinion really mattered. And it happened to be correct. I believe very strongly that all games of Mysterium should be videotaped because someone usually says the correct answer right away and everyone is like, no, it's not, it it can't possibly be that, that makes no sense. And as the ghost, you're like, come on people, just listen, listen. So I think the very fact that you have no way of knowing for certain 
whether or not it's the correct answer makes it much more difficult to quarterback. I'll find a way. And you also have it since since there's a very clear way of since you know that you're right or wrong, you look like a jerk when you insist on something and then people will know that you're burned. And because if you say it's definitely this character, well, you know, you'll know soon enough whether or not that's right or wrong. You can't in a game like Pandemic, you can't say what would have happened because, oh, it was just a random card or it was a lucky guess sort of thing. In Mysterium, there's a very clear outcome. And I think that helps prevent it. And even if you bully someone into choosing your answer, you're, you're wrong once. No one's going to trust you for the rest of that game. Yeah. You're done. On that note, I want to mention a theme that I'm just made up top of my head, sacking or qu- counter quarterbacking. Like in a team base where you have, say, code names and you're trying to give clues and someone that knows you really well on the other team is misleading everybody with, mi- with you know, bad clues or bad insights to try to mislead your own team. Yeah, I could see that being the case in team versus team games. One of my ideas for uh, preventing quarterbacking was social deduction mixed in with uh, cooperative because when you have the social deduction aspect to the game, it prevents people from quarterbacking because they don't know your true intentions. I think that you're taking it out of Jim's definition of cooperative, then it's no longer a cooperative game if you're going by Jim's definition. But if you still have individuals working towards the same goal, like, say, Battlestar Galactica and, say, Bang the Dice game, you have people where their roles aren't completely hidden. Yeah, I don't consider either of these cooperative games. Well, like I said, I consider both of them to have cooperative elements, but they're social deduction games. Battlestar Galactica having the traitor mechanic, which is interesting because you don't know how many traitors there are. And the traitor, if someone was good, particularly in Battlestar Galactica, you don't know were they a phase one traitor or a phase two traitor. The problem is, is that I am always going to be the bad guy. (laughs) I don't know why. Maybe it's the name and the fact that I do everything to encourage this. I come across as very untrustworthy. So... In a in a game where there might be a bad person, it's Jim and who else? Like <laughs> if it's if there's one bad person, it's Jim. If there's two bad people, it's Jim and someone else. I that that makes it really hard for my experience, which is why I like one versus all, because for some reason everybody likes the idea of trying to gang up and beat me. Uh not sure why that is, but so I, 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 I see where you're going there, but I d it would it would cheapen my experience because of how people perceive me. Let's, can we talk about quarterbacking and Hanabi and how you cannot and how that's a personal hell for people who are quarterbacks? Like if you know a quarterback, play Hanabi with them. You can't. You, the rules actually prevent you from quarterbacking in Hanabi because there's limits on what you can and cannot say. And you can only you can only give eight clues. So, yeah, if you have a quarterback in your life, play Hanabi with them to see how much they like that game. They will not. Well, I, I can't say that. I love Hanabi and I quarterback. I think there are other games that have come out since quarterbacking became a phenomenon that have done a good job. Magic Maze is a really interesting one because you can't actually talk. You have to do something in order to be able to get time to talk, and it's very limited. Dara mentioned that time constraints will in, will uh, inhibit quarterbacking, and I totally agree. One of the games that I'm going to put on my 2018 challenge is Space Alert, where you can totally talk about what you're going to do. There are periods of silence, but you don't actually know how things are going to play out and there's so much going on in such a short amount of time and so many things that you need to do that you really need to do your part well and it really emphasizes the individual because someone is going to make a mistake and they're going to fire a rocket too early or it's going to they're going to forget to press one button in a sequence and as a result they're not in the room where they thought they were so it definitely maintains your individuality when time forces you to think quickly and causes you to make mistakes. I would say another along that lines, or at least that jog my memory, is time stories because you don't have full information. Your players are going to different locations, and only if you're at that location can you see the card. And then your time constraint is your time unit, so you don't have the time units to go to every location and investigate everything and tell people what they should be doing. And also you could get locked into a location and then you're, you know until you fight somebody. And that sounds like it eliminates one of my biggest pet peeves, which is analysis paralysis. I'm really quick at making decisions, and it drives me nuts when people just sit there and think. Is that why you always lose? 
Um, <laughs> I believe I beat you in seasons, which takes a long time to think about. By like three points. Victory is still a victory. You stole 80 points from me, but we're getting off topic. <laughs> <laughs> no, I agree with Eric. Um, analysis paralysis is bad enough in any game when everyone else individually has to do their analysis paralysis on every turn to come up to a collective consensus. That can be really annoying. And that's one of the few benefits of quarterbacking that you can help newer players understand the mechanics if you do it in a fair way where you explain all the different options and how those ben- options can benefit. If you don't just tell them one way, if you tell them all the way, I guess that's more like coaching, not necessarily quarterback. if we're going to stick with the football motif here. Let's stop with the sports, please. <laughs> well, I had one more sports metaphor. Oh, God. Um, and it, uh, it was in agreement with Eric that if you make the game so difficult – that it's really hard to say what may or may not work. In other words, throwing a Hail Mary, I think that could lead to some other interesting outcomes and ghost stories come to mind. I know you're a big fan of that game. What's the win rate? Like 10%? For me, personally? No. My mind's really high because I only play with like one other person. So we're on the same level of telling each other what to do. (laughs) (laughs) One, two out of three, we're good. I've won one out of one point one turn. Yeah, I, we we lost the first one because we were playing with with two new people. I mean, we were new to the game also, but I just if you play enough cooperative games with like one person, then you know if you're going to be a good pair. And that's a game where if you actually want to win, I would suggest playing with your friends that have the most experience playing cooperative games. Um, but if you want to just play it for fun and get beaten down, you know, <laughs> just invite everybody to the table. It's fine. If you like a sharp poke in the eye with a stick. Yeah. Ghost Stories is, I mean, it's deliberately, insanely difficult. Right. Which means that, you know, if the best move has a very little chance of succeeding, then a bad move has an equal chance of succeeding. And therefore, you're more likely to be ex- receptive to other people. Because ultimately, the mm. best laid plans come down to a die roll anyway. I don't know. I don't think it actually does come down to a die roll usually. I think a How? lot of the game is collecting the tokens and um, fighting in the same location so that you can share. So, like, I try very hard not to be dependent on the dice roll because I roll terrible. What I, uh, well, I agree with you, but I'm saying that there, there are times when you will need to just roll dice and go for it. You know, there's there's a monster that appears. You can't lose that location. You just have to say, all right, throw strategy to the wind and just go for it. Never throw strategy to the wind. So one <laughs> one weakness I want to bring up is... We're done with the weaknesses, Eric. Move on. <laughs> <laughs> well, it could not necessarily tie just to cooperative games, so I'm, I'm kind of worried about mentioning it, is replayability. Some cooperative hmm. games limit themselves on replayability because i played pandemic and it feels the same every you're time you're wrong you're so i know wrong. I'm, I'm saying that kind of tick what? you off but at the same time <laughs> it's like how many I've uh of the expansions have you played with none all right then you should push i don't apparently <laughs> i don't do very many expansions i so. agree and disagree with eric but first i want to ask what difficulty are you playing on uh we played with all but two of the uh with That's the epidemics. Beginner four. So you can scale the difficulty. Right. But at the same time, it's either you live or you die by a horrible disease. I mean, like, what's the big deal? I mean, okay, every game is you win or you lose. There no, when there's no <laughs> replayability in board well, games. I mean, Let's you're burn going them around, all. You're picking <laughs> up cubes. You're, you're, you're moving around. You're switching cards. I mean, there's nothing really unique. It just sounds like the thing doesn't appeal to you. Maybe it's just the thing. I don't know. Maybe I just don't like picking up cubes. <laughs> Stay away from Euro games. <laughs> I think that w- one of the things that we talk about with Gamer Academy is what are the common trends of a mechanic. And I think variable player powers are a common trend in cooperative games that specifically increase the replayability of them. Mm-hmm. So Pandemic comes with seven characters, six depending on the edition that you have. Forbidden Island comes with six. Forbidden Desert comes with six, and there are five people, and you can play with different player counts. I think the replayability comes by fluctuating on the player count, the difficulty level, and the specific powers that you have. 
uh, I'm going to pick Forbidden Desert as an example. I love that game, which is ironic because I'm typically not a cooperative gamer, because of how well the different powers really change the game. If you have the water carrier, you don't need to water, worry about water as much. Whereas if you don't have the water carrier, I'm going to bet that you're going to die of thirst. In fact, depending on what characters you have, if you have the archaeologist or the climber, both of which who start with three waters, there are four sunbeat to stounds. It is possible to die before the deck reshuffles, and that adds a sense of urgency that doesn't necessarily appear in the game at other times. So the variable player powers, which Ghost Stories also has, and I'm sure that there's other cooperative games that have them as well, it's not just a Matt Leacock thing, that will increase the replayability. The problem, the, the reason why I agree with you, is that once you've solved it, if, if, a game be, if a game devolves to a puzzle, like Hanabi does, which I've heard Hanabi can be solved, once you've solved it, you have no reason to play, because you can do the same thing over and over again, and expect this, the same results. So you need a game that either prevents that through randomness or has a way of changing itself over time, which is usually accomplished by increasing the difficulty level. And Pandemic has those things, Eric, just so you know. Like the board is variable. The setup is different each time. One of the things that I like to do for fun in my solo Pandemic time is just to set the characters on random for two characters and see what terrible combination I can try to play against on Legendary. And man, that's fun, and you get destroyed. I have an uncanny ability to keep getting the contingency planner. I contingency don't know why. Contingency planner is not great. Particularly when you don't have event cards. Yeah. The contingency planner lets you pull an event card from the discard pile for one action, and you can basically use a card twice. The event cards are very good, but if you don't draw them, like me, your then your skill is useless. Your skill is useless. Can we have an episode where we just talk about pandemic? Yes. I guess I won't be on that one. <laughs> yeah, you can. I'll yell at you. <laughs> um, I was going to say, uh, I know you haven't played it yet, but Spirit Island, um, you should check that one out when it's, I don't think it's out of print at this moment because it was a release at uh, Gen Con, but it's one that has variable player powers and it also you have your unique um, deck of card. You're, you're basically deck building. Um, so you have an additional mechanic that also helps, keeps you from quarterbacking because everyone's character has so much going on that like at most I'll be like hey can you help me do a certain thing this turn but I'm not really concerned with what other people are doing I'm definitely not directing them what to do I'm asking them what can you do this turn because I don't know what cards are in their hand and I have enough to keep up with without trying to remember what their characters do right and having those hidden cards are beneficial to and I mean even they don't stay hidden because you you're cycling through that those cards very quickly so if you were super hardcore you could know what someone else had in their deck within a few turns but you're so focused on yourself in that game so that's one that i would recommend looking into i don't really like the theme as well so i have a pet peeve about cooperative games and i admit that i'm guilty of the opposite of this there there aren't a lot of mechanics that produce this effect where Someone either will or won't, and in my in my experience, they will exclusively play this type of game. I have met too many people who only play cooperative games, and I don't think that's the game's fault, but it's very annoying where it's, you know, the person is going, if you're playing a competitive game, but the person's going to be sour about it. And, you know, no one really says, like, I only play deck buildings or I only play set collection. That would be ridiculous. I need names. Who are these people, Jim, so I can befriend them? Uh, <laughs> one would be my wife. <laughs> really? Yeah, she loves cooperative but games. But she'll play other games, won't she? She'll play them, but mostly begrudgingly. She actually played her first game of Smash Up the other day and actually had a fun time. That was not her first game. No. Oh, I mean, man. I mean, no, no. Her you first game in a while. Wife. Her first game in a while. <laughs> She had played before. No, no, no. Her first game of Smash Up that she enjoyed. She oh, played them before okay. and never really enjoyed it. Okay. But her first one where she enjoyed it afterwards. Where afterwards she was like, I didn't win, but I had a lot of fun. And I'm like, good. We're How many people progress. were playing? Was it three? No, four. Well, then that's baloney. <laughs> Smash Up is best at three. Well, maybe because she was cosplaying ninjas. And <laughs> that's her thing. So Ninja geeks. 
as I mentioned, there are people who will play exclusively cooperative games. I have the opposite effect where if I hear that a game is cooperative, even if it looks really cool on a number of levels and does something different, I hit the pause button immediately. I hate to pick on Hanabi, but I had a chance to buy it for $5. Now, Hanabi has probably the smallest footprint of a game that you can envision. It's a very tiny box, and it's $5, which is nothing for a game. And I still passed on it, because it, the game itself is not bad. It just is so... I played it with some really bad people, and I promised Dara that I will play it with her eventually. But it's just so prone to bad play that it can make it agonizing, excruciating to play. Where if someone starts out of the game and says, like, that's a four. Well, why do I need to know that right now? You've used one of our precious hints on something that no one cares about right now. Sounds like a personal problem, Jim. Yeah, their <laughs> problem, not mine. There's so, nothing inherently wrong with Hanabi. It's the people you're playing with. I, again, but the game brings out the worst in me as a result. And it also, if you make a mistake, it really shines a light on that and i have a hard time with that well i guess i have the opposite because i don't think of myself as a competitive person but i think competitive competitive games can definitely ring out um the worst in me sometimes you know the yelling and shouting and not quite flipping the table but pretty close um cooperative games at worst i'm going to quarterback i mean compared to me being angry at people that's not so bad <laughs> so one aspect of kind of tying back to preventing quarterbacking is where you have cooperative elements. So if you take the Lord of the Rings deck building game and it starts off if you play regularly, it is purely co uh, purely competitive. But there's an impossible mode where it's incredibly difficult. And the win condition or there's, there's a lose condition where if you lose, everybody loses. So there's no eventually someone will win. And there, that makes an aspect of, you know, I still want to help the person. You have the ability to start defending for other people. So you have this condition where you're helping each other, but at the same time, you're still trying to win. So you don't necessarily want to quarterback the other person because you don't want them to win. But at the same time, you don't want to lose either. There's a word for that. It's called semi-cooperative. <laughs> and we're not talking about that right now, Eric. Jeez. Well, I, I have a problem with semi-cooperative because, you know... Is this where we talk about Dead of Winter? Well, sure, we'll get to Dead of Winter, but I wouldn't say that Dead of Winter, I, Dead of Winter you is more... You can't play it pure co-op. But, but it's more of a traitor mechanic. Where you, The point is that... But even everyone who's on the same team, they have their secret uh, objectives, so that kind of does make it semi-cooperative because you may be holding back things that could help the group for your personal agenda if you're not willing to sacrifice your potential win so that everyone else can win. I would agree. I would agree with you there. But in a semi-cooperative, competitive game, the problem I have is that there are certain people who will tank the game if they can't win. Like if I can't win, I'm not going to let you. I'd rather say we all lost. Um, this was particularly uh, the case in Castle Panic, where uh, on very early on, someone would not make a trade, and as a result, we all lost. And the person was fine with losing because someone else didn't win. <laughs> it's semi cooperative is very hard to pull off. It's were why you, were you to someone else? No, but it is someone in our group. You know who you are. You're <laughs> listening to this soon. <laughs> are we going to have a special edition with them? Again, the person knows <laughs> who they are. I would say uh, deck builders are very good for cooperative games and preventing quarterbacking, though, in general, because even if you could offer. Um, advice, usually you might be offering advice for someone to purchase a card so that they're not purchasing the card you want for yourself. I mean, come on. Yeah. You still have that, like, I want to maximize what I'm doing mm -hmm. element. There are a lot of cooperative deck builders out there. As someone who plays deck building a lot, I amazingly have never played a cooperative deck builder. Oh my God. We're going to fix that with Harry Potter in the Dominion Room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, one thing also, uh, Arkham Horror, the card game, is another game that I think prevents quarterbacking because everyone has a unique deck. So I don't know what's going to be in your hand. I, don't, I know that you specialize in a certain thing and I specialize in a certain um, area and that's about it. So I think we're running out of time. We've covered a lot of ground. It looks like we need to have some more segments purely on cooperating. Pandemic. 
on pandemic, on quarterbacking, on playing with that person, a specific person, <laughs> you know, pr- personality and, and cooperative games. The last thing I want to end on are recommendations. If you are someone who likes cooperative games or likes the cooperative nature and wants to get in gaming as a result, can we think of one or two suggestions in each subgenre that you might recommend? So, Dara, what would be your recommendation for a co-op game? What would be your recommendation for a team game? What would be your recommendation for a one versus all game? I'm going to ignore that question because I don't think those are all cooperative games. <laughs> um, just kidding. Uh, Harry Potter, Hogwarts Battle, which is, I think is probably Eric's going to say also, so I'm stealing your answer, um, I think would be a good one to start out with. Pandemic, if you're all on equal footing and new. Um, mechs versus minions, definitely. Team games, I love Battlestar Galactica, but I wouldn't recommend starting out with it. I don't know if there's a team game that I'm like, yeah, start out with that. Team games can be difficult, but maybe someone will jog my memory for something else. Um, and one versus all, yeah, I don't, Fury of Dracula is not something I would recommend people start with. <laughs> I can't think of a one versus all that I would recommend as a starter game. I, w- I like pure co-op as starter games for the cooperative. So I would second that motion on Harry Potter for pure cooperative. It slowly s- scales and it introduces new mechanics slowly. And so it's a great way to introduce new players to cooperative. For the one versus all, I'm going to actually go with Super Dungeon Explorers. It's much quicker than Fury of Dracula. It's uh, It can be done in maybe 30 or 40 minutes, depending on the who the mastermind is and how quick he is at processing. And for the team base, I'm actually going to say code names. So with team base, I know it's team versus team. Uh, you're, you're giving me that look like, what, what's this guy talking about? So code it's, names does not it's count. It's cheaper price. Uh, what, what's the price of code names at the time? Of the $12 to $15. $12 to $15. It's easy to get into. Uh, Harry Potter is about 40 to $50, depending on where you get it. Uh, unfortunately, Super Dungeon Explorers is close to the you know $75 to $90 range. So it's a little more costly than... Battlestar Galactica, I think I bought my edition for like 25 bucks. It was on sale. It was great. Uh, but yeah, so different price points, but for introducing somebody, definitely try to find somebody that already has the game before you buy it. I think we talked about this in our regrets. Not not me. I wasn't on the regrets podcast, but when I was listening to it, definitely there were some regrets there. You jog my memory for a second. Um, one versus all, I would suggest Tragedy Looper. I've only played it once, but it seems like one where the one person knowing more about the game is be- is a benefit. It's not going to be a handicap. So I enjoyed that a lot. Although having only played it once, it's hard to recommend it for beginners. <laughs> but I don't think that's a beginner game because one, there's a limited shelf life of the game. Two, it requires a lot. I haven't even played it, but I've studied it immensely and John is going to get me to play it one of these days. I was also sitting next to you while you guys were playing it. I would say that's a little bit too complex for a new person game. Even if the only one person is not new to it is, I guess, because in every one versus all you have that. If the one person who's playing against everyone else knows the game better, it's usually very bad for everybody else. But I feel like tragedy looper is one where that's not necessarily the case because you need someone who knows the game better to teach it. For my pure co-op game, I would suggest Mysterium. It is kind of pricey, but you can generally, uh, you can meet, if you know someone who has the game, it's a great way to introduce them. It's very simple because they can be the ghost. You want the ghost to be skilled, and then they can't, they, they play the game, but they can't quarterback, they can't do anything. It's relying, it's great to play with six new players with one experienced ghost. I've done that a lot at conventions with great success. So I'd recommend Mysterium. If you were looking for something cheaper, I would actually suggest Forbidden Island because it's probably the easiest of the big Leacock 3. It's also the cheapest. Sometimes Pandemic will feel like Forbidden Island will feel like a step down. It's sometimes called Pandemic Light. It's probably better to start on the easiest one and then work your way up the chain. For a team game, I understand uh, Eric's suggestion of Codenames. I'm assuming at this point you've already played Codenames. If you are, that, that game is just crosses so many checklists for me for introductory game that it should be like 
regardless of genre, one of the first things that people should experience. I don't know that I have a specific one. I really like Last Night on Earth, but I'm alone on that. That can rub people the wrong way because of the campiness and uh, some I of the styles. I enjoyed shooting you. That was fun. Yeah, yeah. I, I, would, I would say that was pretty enjoyable. I would like to retract all my advice and say listen to Jim. He had a pretty, pretty good. Mysterium's a really good gateway. But uh, yeah, Codenames is great. Um, Last Time on Earth is also expensive, but again, if you if you have someone who already has it, I think the idea of you being the zombies and everybody ganging up on you will be great. And you can play it with another zombie. So it's team. You can play it in. It can be a one versus all, depending on the player count. But for a pure one versus all, I would actually recommend a newer game called Not Alone. And this is really interesting. Be- this is the one with the creature that you guys destroyed me on. Where you have the locations one through five, and you all play a card simultaneously, and I pick a card. I pick a location. Eric is nodding his head, realizing now <laughs> about the game. That one felt almost a little too easy once we got past the initial stage. No, because I. One one thing I would say about not alone is that the creature should be allowed to write down what cards people purchase, because there were times when I had narrowed it down to. Certain, a certain player is going to the special location that they own, but I could not remember what it was because I was hosting and distracted. So, you know, I, I had a 50-50 chance. Either he's going to six or eight. He only owns one of them, but I don't remember which one he bought. So that was a little bit of a different experience. The other thing is that a lot of people have said that the creature has an advantage. I know it didn't play out that way, but the creature does have the advantage. So it's easy to make a new person be the creature. And that way they a new person has a chance of being on the one side of things while not being, you know, I think their inexperience will counter out the overpoweredness. And I think that's really great because it's really hard to have a new person. One of the problems with like a one versus all game is that if you're all discovering it together, who's going to be the one? That's really difficult. And that not alone game kind of prevents quarterbacking a little bit because you can't discuss, hey, you should go f- eight. Because then the monster's going to go, mm, yum, yum, yum. I'm going to eat you at eight. Because you really can't tell the other people what to do because then the monster knows he's sitting right there. Exactly. You guys also had the uncanny ability to pick the same location as a group together. Like, you would think, I've got a one in three chance of getting it. But you all picked five. And then you all picked four. So, I don't know if you guys are tapping under the table or something. That, that was uncharacteristically good on your part. Yeah. Rare occasions when the stars align. <laughs> Anything else you guys would like to say about cooperative game for this first installment of what apparently is going to be many? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, uh, I think I'm good for now. Thank you very much for having me. Same. Thank you, John. Well, thank all of you for listening. We hope you learned something about cooperative games. Don't let our bias influence you in one way or the other. What's important is that you play what you enjoy. Hopefully you learned a little bit more about some of these terms. This was Gamer Academy on the Board Game Bandit, and our game has just begun.